Okay, we're looking at, in our series that the Lord gave to us through his word, we're looking at the light of God. Why are we looking at the light of God? Because you can't do anything without the light of God. You can't see. Uh, nothing lives. In fact, nothing is even created by God unless he first says, let there be light. That's the first thing God speaks. Whenever God wants to do something, he gives you light to see it first. Without light, you don't even know God's done anything. Without light, you don't even know God's there. When God appeared, there was always an explosion of light or uh, an eminence of light or some form of manifestation of light throughout the whole Bible. And everyone's testimony in the Bible, when they saw Jesus in a, in, in a, in a special way, there was always light present, shining on him, through him, out of him, upon them, in them. There was all these aspects of this light being shone. And we looked at, looked at primarily the introduction that Jesus is that light. He's the light of the world. Without Jesus, you can't see anything. You can't understand anything. Jesus made that clear in all of his teachings. Without him, you have no life and you have no light. And then we looked at how God displays his light in the face of Christ. And we looked at the light of God's countenance. And then we looked at God's word bringing light, how you have to have God's word coming to bring light. Otherwise, you can't just want a physical feeling or manifestation. You've got to have God's word shining on you. And then last week, we looked at the lamp of God, the sources of light. And we looked at seven different things that God uses to give us light. And so why are we doing this? We're not doing this for, for teaching for the sake of teaching. We're doing this so that you can have light. You need light today. You need to be able to see. You need to know what God's doing. You need to know what God's saying. You need this, and the only way you get this is through light. If you don't know these things, it's because you haven't got light. You, you can't see. Yeah, that's right, you can't see. But the problem is, it's a light issue. If you'd, if you'd receive the light, you would see. And you would understand, because that's how God works. That's how God likes to do things. And so we looked at seven lamps, and each one of those seven issues we looked at last week is a whole topic in itself. So I want to re-look at one of those things it said was a lamp, uh, but let's just look at it in a different way. So let's go, can we go into the King James Version? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 22. Now last week we looked at Luke, the Gospel of Luke's version of this. I just want us to now look at Matthew's. Uh, statement of it. Matthew 6 verse 22 is found in the Sermon on the Mount. I like the way the King James Version puts it. The light of the body is the eye. Now last week we looked at that the spirit within you is a lamp that produces light, but this is talking about the body. The light of your body. Do you want light in your body? Not talking just about spiritual things now. We're not talking about spiritual enlightenment and revelation. I want us to look at a very practical aspect of how God's light works through you. By sticking with God's word, we'll look at how God gives light. So the light of the body is your eyes. Do you want light in your body? Right, then it depends on what your eyes are doing. If, therefore, your eye is single pure, your whole body shall be full of light. Your body will be full of light. If your eye is single. Now, here's an interesting thing. You've got two eyes. Yeah? Most of us. Now, let's just do a little experiment. With your left eye, look at that wall. Now, with your right eye, look at that wall. Go. Why aren't you doing it? Because your eye is a single. But you've got two. I know. But that's how vision works. Two witnesses. Right? When you can see, but they should be single. You should actually be looking at the same thing. Actually, 
there's something wrong if you can't look at the same thing. Your eyes have to be focused. Okay? So, singleness. You've got, what are you looking at? I don't have light in my body. Well, what are you looking at? Are you trying to look at two different things? Because have you noticed, when you try and look at two different things, you don't see either one properly. Next verse. So we want our whole body to be full of light. Well, it depends on what our eyes are doing. But if your eye is evil, the whole body will be full of darkness. If it's not single, if it's trying to look at two different things, or trying to appropriate two different things, or live two different lives, or being one thing and another thing, you know, have you ever tried to be clean and dirty at the same time? Do you know what? You're dirty if you try and do that. If you try and have one foot in the bath and one foot in a, in a bucket of mud, not that I've ever done that, but if, if you did, you, you, you're dirty. You can't say this bit's clean. No, you're dirty. If your eye isn't single, evil, the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters. That's not a second, this is not a different subject. No man can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is the, it's, it's, it is the metaphor for the God of this world, money, life, wealth. Just Which one are you looking at? Because that will depend on whether you've got light. Whatever else you think about those things, whatever your opinion is as a Christian, you think you can do, and every Christian has a different version of what God wants them to do or what they think they can do. If you're trying to do two things, you're doing nothing. And you can't see. Do you know how I know that? Jesus said it. There's, not, there's nothing upsets me more when I try and tell Christians something and they say, well, that's your opinion. No, no, that's not my opinion. That's Jesus. You've got to be focused, single, on what God wants you to look at. Otherwise, you won't have light. You'll be in darkness. The light of our eyes. What in life are you actually looking at? And I mean sometimes in a literal physical sense. What do you like to do? What's the sum of your joy? What brings you blessedness? What brings you happiness? Is it God or the things of God? Or is that something you don't actually like doing, but you think you ought to do to get into heaven, but actually you like looking at something else? Because it's the light of your eyes. It's your eyes that let in light. Let's go to Psalm 13, verse 1. Let's look at some applications, how David understood this, King David. Um, getting light through our eyes. What I hope is happening as we look at God's word is that light's coming to get you to see. Don't reject that light or you'll step into darkness. And once you're in darkness, you'll try and focus on things and, and live your own life without true light. To the tr chief musician, a psalm of David. We'll go back into the NIV. I'm, I'm going to switch between different versions this morning. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? What's David's problem here? He thinks... He's been forgotten. He thinks that something God said hasn't happened, so God's forgot. How long will you hide your face from me? Remember what we've looked at in this study. The face, the light of God's countenance is, is, is so essential to being in God's presence that it's actually the same thing. And so David feels as though he's, not in God, he's lost God. God's forgot about him. And he's not aware of God. And he's not aware of God's presence. Now that's pretty amazing for the man after God's own heart. The, the man that God holds up as the supreme example of someone who knew, knows him best is still saying, I can't feel God. So when you are saying, I can't feel God, you're not alone. The greatest people in the Bible thought that. In fact, one man's last words were, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one man who never lost God because he was God still felt that. 
How long will you hide your face from me? You can't see the light of God's face. You can't feel it. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? How often are you trying to think things through and you just can't do it? Do you know why? You haven't got light. You, I just can't understand this. Well, you never will. You're not God. And day after day, I've sorrow in my heart. Doesn't matter how much I try and think this through. Doesn't matter how much I try and sort this out. I've still got that knowing pain, that sorrow in my heart about these issues. How long will the enemy triumph over me? How come I'm living in defeat? How come everyone seems to be like be picking on me? How come, how come I'm, not, I'm not winning? Do you know what? David never lost a battle. I mean, David was undefeatable in battle, but yet he still felt like he was losing. You see, that's what darkness does to you. Is anyone here scared of the dark? Can I tell you something? If you're not scared of the dark, you're weird. You're supposed to be. I hate the dark, me. I, I still, when I'm locking up this church on a night, I run out as fast as I can so the ghosts don't get me. <laughs> now, I know there's no ghosts in this church. There's only one ghost, the Holy Ghost. I just, but I just don't like it. I don't like being in the dark. I don't run out because I think the ghost will get me. I run out because I don't like the dark. I do. I lock up as fast as I can, turn the lights and run for the door. Because you're in the dark and you can't see anything and you don't know what, oh, I just don't like it. It's not superstition. You're not supposed to like the dark. You're created to live in light. We are children of light. So if you're not scared of the dark, seek help. You're not supposed to like the dark. How long will my enemies triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. What's his prayer? What's his prayer? Give light to my eyes. David knows I need light coming to my eyes. The eyes are the windows to the soul. If, you, if our eyes are full of light, our whole body will be full of light. If we can see God's light, in his light we see light, the Old Testament tells us, then all these other things will sort of melt because all these other things come from the darkness. So thinking that we're hidden from God, thinking we've been forgotten by God, let me tell you something, God can't forget you even if he wanted to. If you're a parent, you know exactly what... You can't forget your kids. Whatever happens to them, you're not, you just can't forget them. They're there all the time, on your heart. God says, see, I've engraved you on, on the palm of my hands. I'll never forget you. Can a mother forget her nursing child? God can't forget you. You're hidden. You can't be hidden from God. Even darkness is as light to him. You can't, you're full of anxiety. Well, God's not, because God knows you're going to be okay if you trust in him. Again, as a parent, you know that. Sometimes your kids, they get all anxious and worried about things. And you know as an adult, that doesn't even matter. By the time you've aged a few years, you want it, you'll realize that's not important. It's me. It does, you don't need to worry about that. No one cares anyway. God's trying to show all these things, but he knows that the only way this is, sorrow will fill my heart all the time. Well, if, so, if, if, if your heart's full of light... Because God's love is contained in everything he does. So it's in his light as well. Perfect love drives out all fear. It drives out all sorrow. But you've got to have the light to know that. And if you've not got the light, you'll still keep looking at darkness. Because the darkness is all around if you're not focused on God. Darkness covered the face of the deep in creation, but God was speaking light. And everything was going to happen as God said. Light B, and so the sorrow, and then all oh, my eyes will sleep in death, David even says there in verse 3. The fear of death. David's going to sleep in death. Do you know what? David's alive forevermore. It's going to be alive for all eternity because he was someone who believed in the Lord, who gave his heart to the Lord, who was a man after God's own heart. And so 
when you read David's Psalms, they usually start off like that. But when he gets light for his eyes, when his eyes can see the light of God, then he realizes that he beholds the beauty of the Lord and he will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Look, get our eyes focused on the Lord so that his light will reveal the truth to us. We will all be tempted, and we will, look at other things. Like Peter on the water, the minute you look at the wind, how do you look at the wind? He says he began to sink in the water. When he started to look, at the, you can't even see the wind, but you can be scared of it. We can look at things and be scared of them, and you can't even see them. No, look at Jesus. Look at the light of his face, so that our eyes receive that light. And when people's eyes receive that light, the fear disappears. You remember the story of Elisha and his servant? He was afraid of the enemies around him. And he says, oh Lord, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he actually saw what was really surrounding them, which was the armies of the heavenly host, God's angel armies. And there were far more of them than there were enemies. And they were there to protect them. But darkness does strange things to you, doesn't it? When you don't receive light for a long time, and when you can't understand things for a long time, the anxiety and the paranoia starts to build up and you start to worry and fret and get stressed. I sometimes think of what they must have thought in the ark. Remember, there was no electricity in the ark. And there were no windows. There was a hatch, one hatch which you could term a window at the top. And they were, in the, they were in the ark for a year or so. Just think what their eyesight were like. After, they were used to like seeing in darkness. What's actually going on? Are we going to crash at any minute? Every day when the mountains are collapsed, is the ark going to crash? Has Noah built it right? And then one day they opened the top of the ark, <clears throat> well after it had stopped raining, months after it had stopped raining, what must have happened when that light suddenly hit them? Blinding. They probably couldn't see anything. They sent out the dove. It's going to be like when we come out with this coronavirus thing. We're not going to know what to do. Can we talk to people again? What's conversation? What's going out? Can we go for a meal? What's holidays? Can you remember holidays? But if we look at the Lord, the light will come. The Psalms are full of this, but it, it depends on the light coming to our eyes. Psalm 19 and verse 8. Psalm 19 and verse 8. Getting the light in our eyes. That's what God's word is to do. That's why we read God's word. So light comes to our eyes, so our body is full of light. The precepts of the Lord, we looked at this the last time when we looked at God's word. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. We love that. God's precepts, the things he, the principles he lays down for us. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, single, looking at one thing, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold. They are than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. So the commands of God that are radiant, that give light to the eyes, they're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. You're, you're not going to get light for your eyes unless you actually love God's word. Unless you actually want God to speak to you. Unless you desire that supremely. Do you really want God to talk to you? Because that's what brings light. The entrance of thy words brings light. Right? The commands of the Lord are radiant. How does it give light? Light to the eyes. Sweeter than honey. Honey was, you know, such a sweet, with our, you know, sucrose and our refined sugars these days, we, we lose that appreciation for real sweet sugary things because we can just conjure it up with buying a chocolate bar. But they had to find honey. What was honey in the Bible? You see, if you want light for your eyes, you've got to want God's word. You've got to have God's word to come to you. Now, in the Bible, honey represents the promises of God. 
You remember the manna that they ate? Manna is a picture of God's word. It tasted like honey. The promises of God. What had they received as a promise? The promise was you will receive a land flowing with honey, milk and honey. So they understood that the sweetness, like when they would find honey, when they would find something that was sweet, to them they equated that with God's word coming to them. Oh, that's, a, that's wonderful. That was the thing they wanted. That was the goodness they needed. And you'll find that when they ate honey in the Bible, it did something to them. Look at 1 Samuel 14. 1 Samuel 14 and verse 27. 1 Samuel 14 and verse 27. So this is Jonathan. They're, they're fighting a battle and they're actually fasting and they're they're all a bit stressed out. Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with an oath, so he reached out, the end of his staff was in his hand, and dipped it into the honeycomb. He raised it to his mouth, and his eyes brightened. Now, what, what, that's really equating two things. We don't necessarily think in putting something in our mouth affects light to our eyes. But God's word does. In fact, if you go to verse 29, it says it again. Just jump down a verse to verse 29. Jonathan said, My father has made trouble for the country. See how many, see how my eyes brightened when I tasted a little bit of this honey. Do you know, do you know how you know someone is really loving God's word? Their eyes brighten. I can tell by preaching. I, I can tell who's actually wanting God's word and who isn't. You can see it in their eyes. Their eyes brighten because they're receiving not just words, they're receiving promises that they know God will fulfill. And you can actually only live on promises. You can only live because you know there is a purpose and a point and a future. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you a hope and a future. That brightens your eyes because you know that what God's saying is giving light that gives you the ability to keep living. Without that, you'll fall into all the problems we just saw that King David listed. But we live by the promises of God because the promises remind us of what God said, not what the latest news has said, not what the latest worry or anxiety or stress has come upon us. They remind us of what God said and they bring joy and direction to us because God's promises are true and faithful. Yeah, but if you haven't got light, you don't believe anything I've just said. It's just meaningless. Just words. We're not talking about words. We're talking about light. We're talking about you being able to see it. You know, Jesus could speak, and some people would say, this is God's son. They once sent police officers to arrest Jesus. The temple, the temple police, we would call them the temple guards. And they says, we couldn't arrest him. We've never heard anyone speak like this. And you know, the, the, the same people who were listening to Jesus, some of them could say, he's demon-possessed and raving mad. He's talking nonsense. What was the difference? It's the same words. Some had single eyes to see the light. Some didn't. Some weren't listening. They were just focused on themselves. Jump to one more psalm then, then we're going to look at some examples. Psalm 38, verse 9. Psalm 38 and verse 9. The light to the eyes. All my longings lie open before you, Lord. My sighing is not hidden from you. <clears throat> my heart pounds, my strength fails me. Even the light has gone from my eyes. My friends and my companions avoid me because of my wounds my neighbors stay away from me he's in quarantine can't see his friends and neighbors everyone's avoiding him some people think it's because he got a disease at this time literally a physical disease no one wanted anything to do with him but all his longings lie open before god he's crying out to god he's sighing he's not hidden from him his heart is pounding. He has no strength. But the main thing is the light's gone out of his eyes. The light's gone. So he can't see. And so all these things now feel very real to him. 
even my friends, even my companions, because of my wounds, because of the, the physical infirmities or diseases I've got, my neighbors are staying away from me. But that's not his problem. They're the symptoms of the real problem. The real problem is the light's gone out of his eyes. You know, this virus is robbing the light from people's eyes. People are just losing hope. People's strength is failing them. People just feel abandoned and hidden and avoided and isolated and stressed and anxious. And they're saying, what, what's the remedy? Oh, the remedy is open the pubs. Then we'll all be okay. That will actually won't change anything. Because that's not the problem. The problem is the light in our eyes. If we are focused on Jesus, if we're focused on God, the light in our eyes stays lit because it's the eyes that is the light of the body. It's the eyes that are the lamp of the body. Don't let the light come out of your eyes. Keep focused on the thing that gave you light in the first place, the thing that gave you light even before this lockdown started, even before all this trouble started, the light you knew about probably even as a child. You knew even as a child, most people, not everyone. Jesus is the light of the world. Don't ever look at anything else for the answers to this world because they'll only come in Jesus. God's not sending another answer. God's not sending any more rules. Everything is perfect in Jesus. If you see Jesus, you see everything God wants and everything God has given to us. If we believe in him, we have eternal life. And so all the symptoms are not the problem. The problem is that we're not allowing light into our eyes. Just close your eyes a minute. Okay? Now, as your eyes are closed, what do the insides of your eyelids look like? Can you see them? No, you can't. Okay, open your eyes. Why can't you see the insides of your eyelids? Now, if you get a torch, and don't do this, it's dangerous, when your eyes are shut and shine it right, you can see the, have you noticed, you can see the insides of your eyelids because the, the light is bright enough to shine through your eyelids. The reason you can't see the insides of your eyelids is because there's no light. It's not because the inside of your eyelids are not there. They are. And if you shine a light into them, you can see all the veins and you can see, you can see that pink ready as it shines through your skin. The issue isn't that you can't see. The issue is there's no light. The issue is not all these things. The issue is there's no light. The issue is not anxiety and stress and worry and longings and hiddenness and feeling forgotten and feeling depressed. The issue is no light. Because when the light comes, the darkness flees. When Jesus comes, all fear disappears. When Jesus appears, we know what to do. And that's why Jesus gives us light before stuff happens. We've mentioned that God warned us about stuff was going to happen a year ago. It's interesting. I was just thinking about more stuff that God told us to do. That if we hadn't done, we'd be in real trouble now. You know, God a couple of years ago told us it was time to close the preschool. Now, if we hadn't closed that, we'd be in a real mess now. It was only a year ago that uh, Joseph came to me and, and said, let's set up Bethel TV so that uh, we'd already got stuff on YouTube, but it wasn't all coordinated. So a year ago, exactly a year ago, just the month before all this COVID happened, we set up the Bethel TV Facebook page and linked it to our YouTube stuff. Do you know, up until a year ago, there'd only been a few tens of thousands watched our YouTube videos. Now there's over a million people and, and, and there's thousands every day watching it. Literally thousands every day. New, new watchers. New people. Why? God gave us light. So we did it. And if we'll obey the light when we get the light, we'll see the light. Light will come to our eyes. But if we rebel against the light, you'll end up walking in darkness. And then you'll wonder what's gone wrong. And what went wrong is you didn't put your faith in the light when it came. Your eyes weren't single to watch and obey the light. And so you fell into darkness and sin. What happened? You stopped looking at the light. That's the first thing you did. We've got to look at the light. Okay, I'm going to look at some examples. Just one more. And if we go to Proverbs, can we go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15? Then I'll look at an example to help us practically. Proverbs 15, verse 30. Proverbs, Proverbs 15, verse 30. Let 
Light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart. And good news gives health to the bones. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Now, you read the Proverbs. I love reading the Proverbs. There's always much deeper meaning than what's going on in its, in its initial understanding. Light in a messenger's eyes brings joy to the heart. Now, when a messenger comes bringing good news, the gospel, that's what gospel means, good news, you would think that the joy to the heart from hearing good news would come from the words of the message. But that isn't what it says. It says the joy comes from the light in the messenger's eyes. Here's a good rule to know if someone really likes you. Don't look at whether the mouth's smiling. Look at whether their eyes are smiling. Look at their eyes. I remember coming to this church first, the first time, and this is like oh, 30 years ago or so, or longer, more than 30 years ago. And I had been to other churches and I'd, you know, heard a lot of people. And I always used to, even as a, you know, a 19-year-old, I used to, I used to like try and assess preachers. So I know you assess me. I'm, I'm fine with that. And I used to look at them and think, do they know what they're talking about? Or don't they? And I remember coming here and seeing Pastor John preaching. And he pre I went to a youth meeting and he preached on the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, in the days when people preached proper stuff. At a youth meeting. the doctrine. I remember it. And I remember, do you know what I remember the most? His eyes. I thought, this man knows what he's talking about. He's seen something. Because there was light in his eyes. He weren't telling stories and just trying to keep people happy. He'd seen something. He's still got it, by the way. See Pastor John and look in his eyes, he still, still sees the Lord. The light in a messenger's eyes. When someone's preaching or testifying or giving something, it's the, the, the good news, the messenger bringing good news. What's happening in their eyes? What have they actually seen? You can't listen to anyone who hasn't seen something. And their eyes will tell you. Their eyes will show you what's really giving them illumination, what's really happening in their heart. It's the shining in their eyes. You know, the apostles. You read the stories in the Bible on the resurrection day. But all the prophets in the Old Testament, you remember Isaiah? My eyes saw the Lord. And from that moment on, his life was, he always knew. I've seen him. The light shone in his eyes. The cherub and the seraphim were covering their eyes. They couldn't look at him, but Isaiah saw him. Because God wants to reveal his light through the face of Christ. And so their eyes had seen something. And I love it when you read the resurrection stories. And they came bursting through the door. And what was the first thing they said? We've seen the Lord. It's true. We've seen him. These were guys who hadn't got a clue what was going on. But they saw him. The women came. We've seen him. They weren't quite sure to believe them. And then Thomas came and says, well, I've not seen him. They says, well, we've seen him. And I think they knew just by looking at their eyes whether it was true or not. It's true, they have seen him. Look at their eyes. You remember the story of the people on the road to Emmaus? It says they were downcast. They were looking at the floor. But when they broke bread and looked at Jesus, their eyes were opened and they saw him. And then they ran back to the other disciples and says, we've seen him. And you can tell when someone's tell you can tell when a messenger is telling the truth because their eyes testify that they've really seen something and they know what they're talking about. And the good news, the gospel that Jesus is alive brings you that health and life because you can see it in their eyes. You can usually tell when someone's lying. You might not know what they're lying about. You might not know everything, but you can usually tell by their eyes. And you can tell when someone's at least trying to tell the truth. You can tell by their eyes. The message is coming through their 
eyes. Okay then, I just want to look at some examples to help confirm this. And the best example to look at is, is Abraham. Because Abraham is a man who lived by faith and had to keep looking to see through his eyes what God was doing. And so we see this example in the Old Testament. So let's go to the first example then. Let's go to Genesis 13. Genesis 13 and verse 14. Right. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west. All the land that you see will give, I will give to you and your offspring forever. Now, that's in our modern English. God says, look, have a look. Have a look around, north, south, east, and west. In the Hebrew, that's not what it says. And the King James it has a better translation for this than modern English. So if we go into the King James, and the Lord said unto Abraham, after Lot was separated from him, lift up now thine eyes. In the Hebrew, it's, it doesn't mean look. It's, it's, there's two words being used. It's nasa and ayin. Nasa means physically lift up. Ayin means eyes. That's totally different than just look. It means purposefully focus on something. Physically, not just look at it, purposefully focus on that thing. You know when you've been to the opticians, and the optician, well, if, if you go to the opticians, I have to go a lot. I, I've got a bit of a problem, you know, because um, I've got two eyes. Yeah, well, we've all got two eyes. But my eyes are like weird. I'm colorblind, that's one thing. But one of my eyes is like I can't focus on it, I can't see anything. And the other eye, you can see that one, one lens is really thick, one lens is like really thin. My other eye is what's called a lazy eye, which means it can't be bothered. It's not that it can't focus, it just won't. It's really annoying. I've tried disciplining it and talking to it, and when I was younger, I used to have to wear a patch on the other eye to try and make the other eye work. But it wouldn't. It's like Christians. It's two types of Christians, those that can't see and those that can't be bothered. No, there's three types, there's those that can be bothered. Anyway, forget the illustration. Oh, yeah, the illustration. So, so the optician's telling you to focus. And as you are focusing on the letters and, and trying to read the letters, I've learned if you memorize the letters when you first go in, he thinks, he can, he thinks you can see. And then as he's telling you to focus, he points this laser into your eye. And tells you to focus. Everyone who's wearing glasses, or you know exactly what I'm talking Tells you to focus, I can't see anything. You're pointing a light in my eye. And then as he's pointing the light in my eye, he's seeing how he's looking inside my eye. And then he's putting different lenses on the special glasses that he makes you wear and putting different lenses. So he's trying to get you to focus. But the only way you see correctly is by keeping focus on the letters at the other side of the room. Lift up now your eyes. Focus on what God is telling you. That's a nice word. Forget the word. Forget the preaching. Focus on Jesus. Lift up now thine eyes. Nasa ayin. Look at it. Jesus says the Son of Man will be lifted up so whoever looks at him. Look at Jesus. Don't analyze the words. Don't just try and look around. Don't try and assess what other people are thinking. Look at Jesus. Abraham, look. What's he looking at? North, he's looking at the promise that God has given him. Why? He was already living in the land. He'd already seen the land. He'd been walking around in the land. Don't 
Focus on it. Don't just think you already know it. Focus on it. Focus on what God has promised. Lift up your eyes. Focus on God's word. Notice there, it said there, after Lot was separated from him. Why is that important? Well, if you go back to verse 10, which is a couple of sentences before, you see why. And Lot lifted up his eyes. Seven essential times in the life of Abraham you find this phrase. It doesn't mean look. It means they purposefully made a life-changing decision to focus on what they wanted. I'm going to focus on what I want. When I wanted Carolyn as my wife, do you know what? I looked at her. A lot. I sit in church worshipping God and gaze at Carolyn. Because <laughs> that is what I wanted. More than God, sometimes yes. She's saying not so much now. What was Lot looking at? Lot lifted up his eyes. Lot's a member of his family. And it was causing all kinds of arguments because you've got two people in the same family, but they're looking at different things. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Do not be unequally yoked. Why? Because you'll have two eyes looking in two different directions. You'll not see anything. And he beheld all the plain of the Jordan that was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, garden of Eden, the land of Egypt, as though it comest out of Zoar, the best things in the world. Lot believed in God, and Lot would actually be saved. But he'd lose everything. Because he looked at Sodom and Gomorrah. He looked at the wealth of this world. He wanted God and everything else. And he ended up getting nothing. Abraham ended up getting the whole country. Because Abraham was looking at God. Lot was looking at the world and what he could get out of the world. Abraham was looking at what God's word gave him light, the promises of God. Lot was looking at what he wanted. And what happened? Everything Lot looked at, he lost. But Abraham who saw him who is invisible, received everything. Man's desire or God's desire. What are you looking at? What I can get out of this world? You won't get anything out of this world. The only thing you will get is God might get you out of this world. But you won't get it. The, the judgment was coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. In fact, Lot's wife was still looking at when it, when it got destroyed and she was turned to a pillar of salt. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Don't look at that. That's all falling down. Look at to where we are going. Lift up now thine eyes. Focus on what God said. Focus on his word. Focus on what Jesus is telling us. Go to Genesis 18, verse 2. Next time Abraham has to Nasa and Ayin, he has to lift up his eyes and focus on something. He lifted up his eyes and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. That's the word there for, for worship, Hebrew word for worship. And said, my Lord, now if I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee. And he, he he encounters God. How does he encounter God? He lifts up his eyes and sees three. It's emblematic of the Trinity. It's actually the Lord Jesus and two angels who are actually going to go and destroy Sodom. It's interesting that the same day Abraham lifts up his eyes, Lot is still living in Sodom. The same day that we can be living for God, one of our relatives might actually be just living for this world. Even on the day Sodom's going to be destroyed, Lot's still in Sodom. Abraham's not. He's had nothing to do with Sodom. He even refused any money from Sodom. 
And what's he doing now? He's now going to encounter God in a different way. And the promise, the promised son of Isaac and the promise of the land is now going to be given to him again. How does he get the promise and how does he receive the promised child? How does he receive the promise of God and the promise of the land? He encounters God. How does he do that? By lifting up his eyes and seeing God. Is that what we're doing? Well, I'm looking at the world. Well, so were Lot's wife. She was still looking at the world when it got destroyed and she ended up turning into a, a pillar of salt because that's all she was looking at. A house, a life, a career, whatever. Look at God. He was going to see God face to face just like all the people we've been looking at throughout this study, this study, he was going to receive the promise and encounter with God. But you're only going to get that if you lift up your eyes and look at God. That's where the light comes from. That's the light for your eyes. Look at the next one, Genesis 22. Genesis 22 and verse 4. This is the fourth one. There's seven times, really, you can look at Abraham lifting up his eyes in this correct way. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. What place? After three days, he journeys from where he was and he comes to a hill, a mountain called Moriah. We would call it Calvary. He lifts up his eyes and he sees the place where the son is going to be sacrificed. Have you seen that? What does the cross mean to you? Have you seen it? Have you seen the place? I don't mean our trips to Jerusalem where we've gone to Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. I don't just mean the physical place. I mean, have you seen what actually took place? After Three days. What had he seen for the previous three days? He'd seen nothing. But after three days, he saw it. He saw that hill. After three days, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. What did he see? Nothing. It was totally dark. But after three, di three days, Jonah came out of the belly of the whale. Jesus says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man should be three days in the earth. Then he'll come out. Have you seen it? Have you seen the cross? Have you seen Calvary? Have you seen what it cost? Because if you've really seen the cost, if you've really seen what happened for you to be forgiven, that light will never go from your eyes. Jesus says, when I, the Son of Man, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Jesus says he was going to be crucified, but after three days he was going to rise again. Have you seen that? Do you know that? Has that light gone into your eyes? Yes, he's the savior of the world. He died in my place. At exactly the same incident, look at verse 13. Just when Abraham thought everything was lost and he would even have to lose his own son. Verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by its horns and Abraham went took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son and Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Jirah Jehovah Jireh as it is said to this day in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided it shall be seen how did Abraham know that his son would live because he lifted up his eyes and he saw the ram, the lamb that was taken instead of his son. Have you seen that? Have you lifted up your eyes and seen that Jesus died instead of you and instead of your family? Because if you've really seen that, the light will never go. Because that light into your eyes is because you've gazed upon the beauty of the cross. You've gazed upon the beauty of Jesus Christ. Even after a three-day trial, you have seen that Jesus is alive. And your eyes have seen that. And you will de never deny that. Do you know what the disciples ran around saying 
why they were persecuted, why they were killed, why they were stoned. They says, we've seen him and we're never going to deny that. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I can see. Yeah, all I know is I couldn't see anything. Now in Jesus, I can see everything. Nothing can change that. No fine-sounding philosophical argument, no humanistic wisdom. Nothing can change what has been seen. He saw the provision of God, the payment for sin. Jump to 20, uh, chapter 24, chapter 24, verse 63. We'll bring this to a close. So at the last stage in the life of Abraham, especially in the life of his son, Isaac, Isaac went out to meditate in the field at evening tide, and he lifted up his eyes and saw. You see, you can look and not see, but if you lift up your eyes, you'll see. And behold, behold, don't just look. Behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah, who's Rebekah? His bride. Lifted up her eyes. She didn't just look. She was looking for a specific person. They hadn't met at this point. The marriage had been arranged, but they'd never met. Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she got off her camel. She stopped her journey. They both lifted up their eyes and saw each other. The bride saw the bridegroom, the bridegroom saw the bride. How did they see that? Because they physically made an effort to look, and they saw and behold. This is why the word look is not sufficient. It's much more important than that. They beheld each other. They nasad, they lifted up their ayin, their eyes, and they saw each other. Do you know the bridegroom is gazing at his bride, the church, and he sees us? Isaac saw her first. Jesus saw you before you were born, and he loved you. Jesus saw you before you were born, and he chose you. Jesus knew you before you were conceived in the womb, and he appointed you to belong to him. But although he can see that, he's lifted up his eyes. Have you lifted up your eyes in a reciprocal process so that you can see that, so that you can see him? Because if, if when I gazed at Carolyn, if she didn't gaze back, I'd be in trouble. Actually, she was gazing at me before I gazed at her, but we'll not go there. Yes, she was. Can you see him? Behold, he comes. Last words mentioned in the Bible. Some of the last words. Behold. Don't just look. Don't just say, I believe Jesus is coming. Behold. He comes. Can you see that? He is coming. The bridegroom is coming for the bride. The bride better be ready. Because he's only taking the brides that are ready. Behold. He comes. Whenever Jesus did something, you'll find that he often did this thing. It says he looked up and he looked up to heaven. Jesus looked at where the light was coming from. Even when he gave thanks, he would look up to heaven. Even when he was opening people's mouths or eyes, it says he would look up to heaven and say, A path to be opened. He knew light was going to come to a person when he opened their eyes, when he opened their ears, when he opened their mouth. He looked at where the light was going to come from. If you need that light this morning, and we all need it, you've got to look at Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus. 
We look at that which cannot be seen so that we can see that which is eternal. Abraham, in those examples, in Hebrews it tells us he was looking forward to the city that was yet to come. He was looking towards his God. He received the promises on earth, but he was looking beyond that. He was looking for the building and the city and the land that was far beyond that. We need to gaze and behold Jesus. Because then light will be given to our eyes. So we've seen there in God's word that the light of our eyes only comes through this process. But we have to lift up our eyes. You can't just casually look. When you're driving, you can't just look around. You have to fix your eyes on where you're driving or you'll not see what's happening. And that's what we are here gathered to do this morning. Let's just all bow our heads. And fix our eyes on Jesus. All the prophets said we saw him. We saw the Lord in his glory. Some of them saw him in a vision. Some saw them physically. Some saw them with the eyes of faith. But they all saw him. We beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only Son of God. Full of grace and truth. Because he came as the light of the world. The team are going to lead us in one song. And we're going to fix our eyes on Jesus. We're going to focus on the Lord. That's the primary thing you need to be doing in this time of darkness. Is focusing on Jesus. Beholding his glory. So as the team leaders in this song. We're not going to sing. Because of the restrictions. But we are going to see the Lord. And we're going to gaze upon him. And let the light of our eyes be renewed. So that we're not in fear and darkness. But we're in the light of God. Let the team lead us. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, team.